Part 5, Airway Exam. This lesson is 11 minutes. Dr. Krako will discuss features of the nasal and oral airway that restrict breathing and the potential role of surgery as a treatment option. So now we're going to go to airway exam. And with airway exam, our fifth module, what we are trying to do is realize that for everything we've accomplished in trying to treat these issues of nasal congestion, we have to be realistic about the fact that everybody's body is built differently and everybody suffers different kinds of experiences in their life, such as you know, how many times was your nose broken when you were 5, 10, 15, 20. And those issues are very important. So a person wants to look for things like deviated septums. And we do that all the time in the sleep center. We will want to examine your nose to find out if there is a deviation. Why? Because a deviated septum seems to trigger allergic rhinitis, non-allergic rhinitis, and it can interfere with your ability to be able to use PAP therapy. In fact, what's so amazing about a deviated septum is that when we think about sleep apnea, it's generally called obstructive sleep apnea because the airway has gotten clogged with the tissues in the back of the throat, say the base of the tongue, so to speak. But you can also have a central nervous system or a central sleep apnea where your brain just shuts down all effort to breathe. Well, deviated septums, again, going back to how powerful and important the nose is in terms of uh, your health and your sleep health, a deviated septum can be a risk factor to trigger central apneas. And where we will see that the most is a person who's trying to use CPAP therapy, and then for some reason with this obstruction, it triggers the brain to shut down momentarily. The person doesn't breathe for 15 seconds. And the body isn't even struggling, like you would with an obstruction where you're trying to draw that air in. So looking for a deviated septum is very important, and we usually look at that in all of our patients. We often send many of our patients to an ear, nose, and throat doctor to get that evaluation because we don't really have the fiber optic techniques at our center. The turbinates, the turbinates are the tissues inside the nostrils that try to filter out some of these uh, particulate matters, the dust, the pollens, and so forth. And over time, they can become swollen. And so now, even though they're trying to do their job of trying to clear out the, the air for you, you end up with deviated septum and swollen turbinates There are, of course, issues of tonsils and adenoids. And let me just clarify that, of course, the enlarged tonsils and adenoids will affect the way you breathe through your nose. And tonsils are very important in children and young adults. And they're less important in adults that are more middle-aged. And the reason is, in part, that you don't generally find very enlarged tonsils in somebody who would be older. If you did, then it would be a very reasonable option to consider removing them because it often will decrease the severity of the sleep apnea. And even more importantly, as with many of these things that we're talking about now, it makes it easier to use PAP therapy. So if you're trying to use CPAP or BPAP, whatever, and you've got a deviated septum, if you've got enlarged tonsils, you're going to have more of a struggle. When you're a child, if you remove your tonsils and adenoids, the chances are you will see a marked reduction in sleep apnea, but you won't see a cure. So can you guess how early in life you have to remove your tonsils and adenoids and thereby potentially prevent yourself from ever getting sleep apnea? The correct answer is less than two years old. They've done some studies on this with some animal models and have noted that when you don't improve the airway early on, the airway is governed to grow into certain dimensions based on what's clogging it at the time. So if you've got tonsils in there and you've not removed them at the age of two, your airway is now going to be more narrow or have a, has a risk for becoming more narrow. 
which means once somebody removes your tonsils at age four, you still could end up with a narrow airway, which means when you're 10, when you're 14, when you're 25, whatever, we see all kinds of patients in the sleep center who've had tonsillectomies. And we've seen patients who've had their tonsils out at the age of four, had a dramatic response, clearly improved growth, no mouth breathing, better cognition, and then four years later, five years later, six years later, that child is now using CPAP because the condition has returned. The third biggest area in terms of nasal breathing, the sinus conditions, again, draining through the nose. Obviously, if there's a problem with the sinuses, they can cause problems of drainage into the nose and congestion. If there's problems with the nose, it can feed back, causing sinus infections. So these are the three most important aspects of the exam that is going to deal with the issue of nasal breathing. And these three areas are places where, in some cases, I will see patients who are very complex. I want them to go to the ear, nose, and throat doctor right away. Some of them will require CT scans of the sinuses to clarify just what the degree of blockage is. Some of them are going to require surgeries, and I'll mention one more, the turbinates, deviated septum, and swollen turbinates. And those are the two most common surgeries. They're called septoplasty to fix the deviated septum and turbinoplasty to fix the turbinates. Now, a couple of points about the turbinates that are interesting in that Years ago, they used to remove the turbinates. They actually would surgically remove them from the nose, and that's not a good thing because it can lead to other problems because the turbinates have sensors uh, in the little hair cells that can help a person gain a sense of their breathing. Without those hair cells, you actually can develop a sense that you're not breathing properly. It actually causes a great deal of anxiety. The term for it was called empty nose syndrome. So we always tell people that if your doctor is recommending a septoplasty and a turbinoplasty, you're fine. If they use the words turbinectomy, you need to inquire to make sure they're not taking out the whole turbinates. And nowadays, most people don't. Most people just remove portions of the turbinates. A lot of people shrink the turbinates. They actually crack them in some ways, uh, the cartilage, and then they shrink down the tissues. So these are, the, these are the main surgical procedures that you want to be thinking about as they relate back to what an airway exam would look like. And we would look at your airways looking to see, is there a deviation or swelling? Um, are there enlarged tonsils? Do you report sinus symptoms or do you have sinus tenderness? And then, as appropriate, uh, we, don't, we don't wait. Now, there's a model where some doctors will see a patient and say, yes, you have a deviated septum, but I think it's fine for you to go and use CPAP. It's fine to go and use that and see what happens. And that's not an unreasonable model because there are many people who have deviated septums that do just fine with BiPAP or CPAP and so forth. It's just that you have to ask yourself, what is your motivation like to use CPAP or to use BPAP? And the answer is that the average person who has a bad experience with CPAP or PEP therapy in general in the first month or so will often discard the use of PEP therapy for one or two years. If something has gone on that's been very, I mean, and you got to think about this in terms of if you put a mask on your face and you blow air in your nose all night long and you do that for one week, and your sleep has gotten worse, you're going to feel miserable. And you're going to feel horribly frustrated. And you've also just had now a conditioned response built in, which is, ah, mask equals really lousy sleep. When that happens, I can send you to see the ear, nose, and throat doctor. The ear, nose, and throat doctor could diagnose a deviated septum and say, yeah, that seems to be the problem. Now you go and you get surgery. Now the deviated septum is repaired. Now you come back and try again. 
but you still have those bad memories. And you might come back a couple of months later and hopefully you've forgotten some of those memories and then you try again and things go smoothly. And it's why when we ha first have people starting out with CPAP or BPAP, we explain that if things are not going well in the beginning, it's prudent to put the thing aside. You shouldn't keep trying and beating yourself over the head because all you're really doing is producing frustration and conditioned responses which will make it so that you're never going to use this thing for a couple years. And that's how powerful that conditioning influence is. So this is another one of these areas where timing is critical. If the patient has an obvious deviated septum, if the first time you would come into the sleep lab and you would notice that you couldn't use the device very well, that might be a signal of don't go any further. Let's go to ear, nose, and throat, find out if there's something surgically that needs to be corrected with one of these day surgeries, because deviated septum repair and the turbinates are usually day surgeries, and then let's pick it up again. And that's a very important part about this concept of the nasal breathing.